Welcome to the Ship Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your overview of this week's precious metals news. It's Friday, October 19th. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. Well, it's been another pretty good week for gold and not such a great week for the stock market, at least for the most part. Gold prices have nudged a little higher this morning with renewed political and economic concerns, including news of China's weak growth. Gold looks to be on for its third straight weekly gain. The recent sell-off in stocks, not just here in the U.S., but globally, has certainly helped gold along with renewed safe haven buying. Gold hit a a two-and-a-half-month peak of $1,233.26 on Monday. From a technical standpoint, gold has been testing resistance near its 100-day moving average around 1226. Some analysts say a break above that level could trigger further gains and put pressure on short sellers. We currently see record shorts in the gold market. Interestingly, we're seeing these gains in the gold market despite a strong dollar. The dollar index is holding near a one-week high after the U.S. Federal Reserve minutes from the last meeting reiterated a hawkish stance on monetary policy. The mainstream normally would consider this a bearish signal for gold. Of course, the biggest news this week has been the volatility in the stock market. The Dow dropped 327 points, or 1.3%, on Thursday. It was down as much as 471 points. Tech stocks fell sharply, sending the NASDAQ tumbling 2.1%. This all came on the heels of a huge drop of over 1,300 points in the Dow last week. Now, stocks rebounded on Tuesday. They were up over 500 points before another wobbly session on Wednesday with the Dow closing down over 90 points. The Dow and the S&P 500 had both dropped more than 4% in October. Meanwhile, the NASDAQ is down almost 7%. Now, as I talked about last week, rising bond yields are probably the biggest factor driving this market volatility. As I talked about at length in last week's podcast, we have rising interest rates in an economy built on debt. And of course, that is not a good scenario. But as I mentioned, we're also seeing some safe haven buying this week due to geopolitical concerns. Probably the biggest thing in the news are the rising tension between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia over the disappearance of a journalist. On Thursday, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin backed out of a conference in Saudi Arabia. Stock market selling picked up after he announced it on Twitter, of all places. The budget situation in Italy is also causing some jitters. The European Commission said on Thursday a draft 2019 budget from Italy was, quote, in particularly serious noncompliance with EU rules. This sets the stage for an unprecedented rejection of the country's fiscal plan. Then we have the ever-present concern over the trade war. China's Q3 economic growth came in at the slowest rate since 2009. And the whole Brexit thing, well, that isn't exactly going smoothly either. So a lot of concerns out there. Uncertainty is historically good for gold, and I think that's part of what is pushing prices up despite the headwinds created by rising rates and the strong dollar. So the question on everybody's mind, is this the beginning of a bear market? Has the stock market bubble finally burst? Are we on the cusp of a big crash? Well, I have no idea. This week, I interviewed economist Mark Thornton for my It's Your Dime video series. He's written a book that explains how skyscrapers can help us predict economic crashes. I hope to have that interview out by the middle of next week. I think you'll really enjoy it. But anyway, he made a really good point about economics and predictions. It's not like a physicist or a chemist. They can make concrete predictions based on mathematical formulas because there are certain natural laws. There are laws of physics. There are laws of chemistry. But in economics, we're dealing with human action. We're dealing with human behavior. And God knows you can't predict human behavior. We can use economic theory, though, to generally understand what's going on in the economy and make projections about what will likely happen in the future. We can look at the dynamics in the economy and draw general conclusions. But the bottom line is I ain't got no crystal ball, so I can't tell you exactly when the crash will occur. I can only tell you that this stage is set, the dynamics are in place, and things are poised to unwind. It's just a matter of time. 
Now, after the stock market rally on Tuesday, a lot of people were saying, see, last week was just a correction, no problem, nothing to see here. And then yesterday happened. It's not like we don't have upward corrections in a bear market. In fact, sometimes we see huge swings to the upside. As Peter Schiff put it in a podcast this week, the slope a bear market slides down is a slope of hope, just like a bull market climbs a wall of worry. So whether or not the stock market went up or down, that doesn't necessarily tell us whether or not we're in a bear market right now. Maybe the market will rebound after we get through this volatility, and maybe it'll make new highs. That's what happened back in February. It's really too soon to tell. But we may also look back on these last couple of weeks and a few months and say, yep, that was the beginning of the crash. Or maybe not. But I still think it's coming sooner rather than later. I've talked about the debt ad nauseum on this podcast, and I'm not going to repeat that analysis. I went into depth in it in last week's Friday Gold Wrap. But there was some news on the debt front that I do want to touch on. The Treasury Department released a report this week. The 2018 fiscal year ended September 30th, and the U.S. government closed out the year with its largest budget deficit since 2012. Uncle Sam ended 2018 $779 billion in the red, adding to the already ballooning national debt. According to the Treasury Department, the 2018 fiscal deficit was $113 billion larger than the 2017 deficit. That's a 17% increase year on year. If you adjust for calendar effects, the gap between fiscal 2017 and fiscal 2018 came in even larger. Now, we've had bigger deficits. Obama ran some that were higher. Trump apologists will be very quick to point that out. Here's the real concern. Although the economy is supposedly in the midst of a boom, the U.S. government borrowing looks more like we're in the middle of a deep recession. We don't usually see deficit numbers like this when the economy is growing. So what's it going to look like when things start to slow down? I want to pivot to another bit of news that came out this week. Most of this year, investors haven't been buying a lot of gold. But central banks have. Well, some central banks have. You can add Hungary to that list. On Wednesday, the Hungarian Central Bank announced it recently boosted its gold reserves tenfold. According to its website, the National Bank of Hungary now owns 31.5 tons of gold. That's up from 3.1 tons. It was the first significant purchase of gold by Hungary since 1986. A statement by the bank said the increase in gold stocks was intended to increase financial stability, and strengthen market confidence. Quote, In keeping with the historical role of gold, it remains one of the safest instruments in the world, which even under normal market conditions exposes its stability and confidence. The bank emphasized that stability goals drove its decision to buy gold, and it isn't merely a short-term investment. Quote, gold also has a confidence-building effect in the normal period. That is, it can play a role in stabilizing and defending not only in the extreme market environment, structural changes in the international finance system, or in deeper geopolitical crises. Gold is still considered to be one of the safest assets, and this can be attributed to unique properties such as the finite supply of precious metals, which is not linked to credit and counterparty risk, since gold is not a claim against a specific partner or country. Hungary is the second Eastern European country to buy gold this year. The Polish Central Bank added about 7 tons of gold to its reserves in July, and then another 2 tons in August, according to the International Monetary Fund. It was the largest gold purchase by Poland since 1998. In fact, a number of countries have been buying gold in recent months to diversify reserves and to minimize their exposure to the U.S. dollar. Central banks have bought a total of 264 tons of gold this year, with Russia leading the way. According to the IMF, central bank purchases accounted for 10% of gold demand through the first half of 2018. It's interesting to look at the reasons these central banks are buying gold. Stability, diversification, reducing exposure to the U.S. dollar. These are also good reasons for you to think about buying gold. On a number of occasions, I've talked about the fact that gold has been on sale. Even though it's rallied a bit in recent weeks, it's still pretty inexpensive. As Peter said in a podcast this week, the fact that gold is still this cheap shows that there is a tremendous amount of complacency out there. Nobody's worried. Everybody says the recent drop in stocks is just a correction. The economy is great, blah, blah, blah. But to quote Peter, we're about to see a sequel to 2008. 
and like most sequels, it's not going to be good. To learn more, talk to a Shift Gold Precious Metal specialist today. Just call 1-888-GOLD-160. Well, that's a gold wrap for this week. You can get more details on all of these stories and more and keep up with the latest Precious Metals news and analysis throughout the week at shiftgold.com news. And if you haven't done it already, you can subscribe to the Friday Gold Wrap over at iTunes. There's a link on our show notes page. Thanks a lot for listening, and we will talk to you again next week.